I sat on the bedroom floor and the world went fuzzy. I felt absolutely fatigued and depleted. Until recently, I never envisioned myself in this position. As I sat, I could feel the texture of the carpet beneath my hands. Kelly and I had spent a lot of money decorating this room. I closed my eyes for a second and shake my head gently, attempting to remove the fog in my thoughts. I wondered how I ended myself in this life. Is this the real me? I opened my eyes and stared at the big wooden bed. I was immediately touched by Kelly's thoughts. I cringed as I realized this would never happen again. Things got out of control. As I lowered my hands, I discovered a whiskey bottle and an empty medication bottle on the bed. The air in the room smelled like booze. I smiled bitterly but was instantly concerned about the letters on the bedside table. There was always a chance that the wrong person would discover them. I sensed approaching sickness and attempted to control it. Why did things have to go this way? There were certainly some people I'd miss, but I doubt they'd miss me. My kid would most likely detest me for such an act, but it appears that she already does. I just couldn't take the anguish anymore. My thoughts were muddled. At the last moment, I recognized my folly and attempted to hang on to life, but I couldn't change anything. Darkness has engulfed me. A week ago, I chuckled heartily as he circled his daughter Grace around our country property in the heart of Perth, Australia. She was 19, and her boyfriend John had proposed the night before. I knew this was going to happen. He found me and asked discreetly whether I would give my blessing. I did it without hesitation. Grace and John had been dating since eighth grade in high school, and I could count on one hand the amount of times they had been apart. Grace has informed my wife, Kelly, and me of this offer every weekend since they began dating. John took her on a treasure hunt, showed her about the city, and then proposed to her under a tree in Kings Park. When they informed us about it the next day in the kitchen, I held her and twirled her around like she was five. I felt very thrilled for them. Despite their youth, I could see their love was strong. I believed that if there was a young couple in our day who had the fortitude to reconcile their lives, it was them. I grasped my daughter's hand again and grinned as I examined the engagement ring. This is terrific, Gracie. I looked across at John. You made the right decision in choosing her. My wife, Kelly, snorted from the opposite side of the kitchen counter. Kelly, even at 42, was still a lovely woman in my eyes. She was a stunning brunette with brown hair, brown eyes, and the tanned skin that many women aspire to. We all turned to see her snort at my comment. My wife raised her glass of wine, saying, You should pass some of this gratitude on to me. You may have bestowed blessings upon them, but I assisted John in selecting her. I was surprised and took note. John is flushing hot crimson. Grace turned to face her fiancé and remarked, Mom, that was inappropriate. It's all right, baby. I adore it. And I understand you made the final decision. There was nothing else spoken. But I have to admit that Kelly's comment made me feel slightly uncomfortable. In all the years we've been together, I've never witnessed my wife say anything so disrespectful, harsh, and out of character that it embarrassed everyone in the room. But if you think about it, Kelly has been a little strange these past several months. I couldn't pinpoint anything at the time. However, there were small things, statements, and acts that, while not typical of the kind woman I knew, seeped into the woman who had just disgraced us. Dinner was a joyous occasion, with everyone toasting and celebrating the couple's engagement. Finally, Grace and John left after dessert, which was apple crumble with vanilla cream that I had baked earlier in the day. They had a little two-bedroom apartment that they rented with our assistance while studying and pursuing a profession that evening. Kelly and I snuggled into bed. I didn't say anything to her, but the inappropriate comment tormented me. Kelly and I woke up slowly on Sunday morning. Something happened that absolutely surprised me. She was really unpleasant, forbidding me physical contact. It took me around 30 minutes to regain consciousness. I was in shock. Kelly had already left when I came out of the kitchen after showering and shaving. She only left a note indicating that she was going. Suddenly, I became enraged. Kelly has never treated me this way in all of my years knowing her. Disrespect, just like this morning. I had no idea what was going on with my wife. I brewed some coffee and kept coming back to the same question. Is she unfaithful to me? I was sipping my coffee and thinking about this when I received a phone call from Roger, one of my best friends. Hi, Bart. How are you doing? He gave a chirp. 
I didn't say anything but the normal greeting. Bart, what happened to you? Is anything wrong? I asked Roger. I spent the next ten minutes describing my thoughts to Roger. Roger laughed in my face. If she cheats on you, mate, there is very little you can do. Divorce is 50-50 and she doesn't work so she'll utterly scam you, he claims. It does not make me feel any better. I responded, irritated by his attitude. I wasn't attempting to console. Roger, who is quite sensitive, remarked, I was trying to be realistic. Why don't we sit down and speak about it at work tomorrow? We must write a report about the Pembroke Project. After that, we may talk about everything. Sounds interesting, I replied unenthusiastically. Roger was not only a personal buddy, but we both worked for the same company. I was the senior engineer and he was the program manager. We developed a strong team over time. I created solutions and he handled the finances and timeline. I somehow got through Sunday. Kelly returned home, but it was almost midnight when she went to bed. She said nothing, despite the fact that she knew I was awake. Kelly made an effort to be nice the following day. That won't happen, Kelly. I muttered this while getting out of bed. Do you refuse to have sex? She asked, staring at me incredulously. I glanced at her before putting on my outfit. I refuse to touch you after you disrespected me last weekend. I swear if you cheat on me. I became mute, unable to finish the thought. Kelly was right in front of my nose. You are going to do it, Bartholomew. There's no way you can say no. She repeated my complete name with a small grin on her face. It softened slightly, but did not totally fade from the face. Listen, return to bed. I need to unwind a little, and I'm sure you do too. She attempted to convince me. I shook my head. Who the heck was this woman? No, it will not happen. Kelly. I don't think you appreciate how contemptuous you are toward me. So fuck you, she said, then went back to bed. I shook my head and exited the room for the first time in our 21-year marriage. I was disgusted with my wife that morning at work. I could not find a place for myself. Myra, my assistant, gave me a troubled look. Are you okay, Bart? You don't seem like yourself. She wrote on her forehead, I am worried. For ten years, Myra Brown served as my work assistant. When she discusses this, she likes to suggest that she was employed out of mercy when Myra arrived to work for the corporation. Her boyfriend abused her after she broke up with him. Myra had to leave her home, taking just her clothing and her one-year-old daughter, Tilly. She arrived at the interview with a black eye, anxious for a secretary post. Aside from a black eye that immediately faded during the interview, Myra was perfectly fit for the position. Overall, she dressed conservatively, although it was difficult to hide her beauty. I must admit that she saw me staring at her a few times over the years, but she never said anything. Myra was incredibly intelligent. She performed the majority of what we did with ease, except for getting knocked up by her nasty ex-boyfriend one night at a drunken party. She was just as witty as everyone else. The company's owner hired her, but assigned her to me, believing that hiring Mary, who had the intelligence to keep up with me while I was working on project implementation, would be a waste of money. Myra earned my respect, since she had a real concern for those around her and an unwavering moral ethic. She was cordial with you until you pestered her, at which point you were dead to her. People were fired from the workplace because they tormented her, believing she was just a foolish beauty, only to discover that her rage was not to be taken lightly. I gazed at Myra, considering what to say about my position with Kelly. Finally, I signed off and told her the truth. Myra frowned briefly after the narrative started, but by the end of my story, her neck was covered in an angry flush. After relating my story, I hung my head, feeling miserable because my wife was most likely cheating on me. I have no idea what to do, Myra. I mean, I never believed she would cheat on me, I said with sadness. Myra's hand touched my shoulder unexpectedly. We have worked together for many years. I could count on two hands how many physical touches we had. I peered into a compassionate set of eyes. Well, Myra replied, First, you must attend the meeting at Pembroke. I received my job schedule just a few minutes ago. There are various concerns concerning the pipe and concrete used in the building. At that point, I felt as if I were returning to work. What? Why is this the first I've heard of it? Roger told me nothing. I answered. Several wheels began to whirl in my thoughts as I considered the architectural arrangements and volumes that I had designed. Myra looked concerned. 
I don't understand why nothing was mentioned, Bart. I just noticed the agenda. It's disturbing. Roger entered my office a second later before we had a chance to think about it. Are you prepared, buddy? He asked, a smile on his face. Roger, what are the concerns with the Pembroke Project's pipes and concrete? I asked quietly, trying to get ready for the approaching meeting. He waved it off. Don't worry, we'll sort it out now. Roger, you are aware that I want to know these things before meeting with a customer. I said, don't worry, buddy, we'll figure things out, Roger replied with a contemptuous tone. The meeting was arranged as an ambush. When we entered, the Pembroke owners were already present. I met them several times and they were always pleasant. However, when I detailed our progress, they grimaced, and as I continued, their expression darkened. What about the Northeast's excessive usage of concrete and pipes? I asked Peter, the majority owner and CEO. I looked across at Roger. He shrugged and said nothing. Everybody was looking at me. I'll look into this because I've heard nothing concerning cost overruns. However, as of last week, reports indicated that everything was normal. Peter's frown grew. This simply cannot be. Can you explain why I signed bid reports for more concrete and pipes totaling more than $200,000 in the previous three months? Peter remarked, staring at me. I glanced at him, not sure what to say. I turned back to Roger. His expression was blank, but he took out a folder and stood up. Gentlemen, if you could let us look into this, I'm confident we'll be able to figure it out. He noticed me. Bart, let's go out for a minute and work it out. I followed Roger down the corridor to another room where our boss, Clarence, was waiting for us. So what exactly did they say? Clarence inquired as we sat down. Roger stepped in before I could say anything. He handed Clarence the folder. They inquired about the missing goods, as we expected. Roger replied. Clarence stared at me, and for the first time in my years of working for him, I noticed fury in his eyes. What are you saying, Bartholomew? The elderly man almost spat on me. I was taken aback by his harsh tone and aggressive expression. Sir, I am at a loss for words. According to the reports I received last week, everything was going to plan. There were no further paperwork necessary, and I was unaware of these signed applications. I didn't approve of them. I answered to the visibly irate boss, feeling as if everything was spinning out of control. He gave me a critical look before opening the folder Roger had handed him. So you stick to this version? Clarence said emphatically, sir. I inquired. I then looked at Roger. He seemed serious. Bartholomew, I have $206,000 in application forms here. The issue is that the payments were made to a bank account that happened to be in your name. Bartholomew, is this how you feel about me after all of these years? Clarence almost yelled at me after this. The conference was halted. Clarence and Roger took turns chastising me for what they said I had done. None of them wanted to know about my innocence. They then called in a representative, and I was sacked abruptly for fraud. Clarence informed me that he had taken it to the police. To top it all off, Myra was dismissed because she could have been implicated in this. Working so near to me as I was brought off of the premises with my few paltry items, I noticed Roger beaming behind me when he realized I wasn't looking. Myra was in the parking lot out front with security, keeping an eye on us to ensure we did not try to return. She appeared surprised, yet she cried while standing by her car. Myra, are you fine? I inquired. She made a sudden turn to me. You are a jerk! Bartholomew, a $200,000 fraud! How could you do this? I trusted you and you fired me! The furious and distraught woman yelled at me. Myra, that wasn't me, I pleaded, isn't it? She was posing. Before they booted me out the door, she showed irritation on her face. Roger showed me the sign at the applications. I noticed your signature. I recognize your signature. How could you do this? She took another glance at me. I noticed hatred in her eyes, aimed entirely at me. She did not want to hear it. I have nothing to do with this. I guess Kelly's sob tale was also a fake. When you told me that she was cheating on you? Seriously, do you think I don't notice the glances you give me when you don't think I do? Once again, a woman I'd worked with for ten years surprised me with a face of sheer, unadulterated rage. I despised you. She spat on me. You damaged all of my prospects of finding another employment. I honestly can't believe I got fooled into feeling sorry for you. You lie, deceive, and steal, and then you dare to ask how I am feeling. Bart, fuck you. I've never heard her swear to hear her words again in all the years we've worked together. I wasn't expecting that. 
but before I could say or do anything, she slapped me hard. You have damaged my career. I cannot obtain a reference. Worse, I've been contaminated by your deceit. I hope that was worth it for you, asshole. I stood there astonished, my cheeks burning from her firm slap. Myra looked at me for a while longer before getting into her car and driving away without saying anything. I didn't know what else to do, so I drove home and parked in my driveway. Kelly was waiting for me inside, so the duped husband returns home with his tail between his knees. You are pathetic, she spat. I didn't notice it at first, but in the days that followed, I pondered why Kelly appeared so joyful, not upset or concerned, but cheerful. So what the heck? Kelly, I did none of this. I don't know what's going on, I said, unhappy and confused, as if I were on the verge of collapse. She was smirking at me. Who really cares, Bart? Now I'm going to leave your ass. I'd never seen such a disdainful expression before. Mary, you don't have a single facial expression. It wasn't that way. A knock was heard at the door. She added, This is for you, still hissing at me. Without thinking, I opened the door for a man dressed in a suit. Hello, Mr. Bartholomew. Another? He inquired. I just nodded. You have been served. He handed me a heavy manila package and walked away. I opened the mail and saw a divorce petition. Divorce via telephone. I felt as if my world was crumbling even further. Kelly sensed my mounting agony and chuckled cheerfully at my misery. You are such an uneducated dumb ass, aren't you? However, this is clearly a hoax. In case you hadn't noticed, I've been dating someone for the past six months. He's left. You've never been to these places. He's quite exciting. And of course, he has a decent income. She looked at me as if I was something you scraped off of your shoe. You no longer have a job, a family, or any friends. And don't forget that you will most likely be imprisoned for fraud by the end of the month. She cast a quick glance at me. Her eyes were full with sadistic joy. I've noticed this appearance developing over the last few months. I couldn't understand why. I only now noticed this. You are pathetic, Bart, so that's all. Do you acknowledge that you're a whore? Is she a cheating woman with easy virtue? I spoke. Anger seeped into my voice. So you just had fun yesterday and today without thinking about me? Kelly gave a laugh. Yes, everything was tied to me. I deserve it, everything. Haven't you realized that this has always been the case with me? She stared at me, and I thought I saw a hint of melancholy in her eyes. We had many happy years together. The gaze went, and the bitch returned. But I'm done with you, Bart, and I'm moving on. Kelly drew closer to me as my world crumbled. Bart, make it easier to assign me a task. Because you will be in prison, I'm requesting a house and the majority of the property. So sign the paperwork. I'm being generous and giving you a week to pack your belongings and move out. But get out of this house by early next week or I'll get a restraining order on top of everything else. So you're still with your lover? I inquired, feeling the weight of all the betrayals from my prior employment and now from my wife. She started laughing again. Of course, his apartment is considerably smaller, which is why we'll move in as soon as you're in prison. But don't bother following me or I will contact the cops. You will be arrested for this and you will be sent to prison. You should not add anything to it. I took out a chair and sat down, unhappy and rejected. Kelly made a couple steps towards me. She then spotted the bright red handprint made by Myra earlier. She smiled as she examined my reddened cheek. At the very least, this female was fired so she could take advantage. Bartholomew, go to the hole and die. Kelly left with that. I didn't do anything for the remainder of the day. I'm not even drinking. The next day, I didn't know what to do either. I was expecting something. I attempted to call Grace, but she transferred the call to voicemail. After around 20 rings, she picked up the phone. What exactly do you want? My daughter's voice was abrupt. Grace, I started to say. Father, leave it. Grace stopped me. Her tone was harsh, nearly contemptuous. Mom told me all about your cheating, lying, and affair with your assistant. Really? Cheating on my mother and stealing $200,000? You have damaged many lives as a result of this, and I can honestly say that I've never been so disappointed by someone in my life. I did not know what to say. There was a brief silence between us, but just when I was about to recover my breath and defend myself, Grace interrupted me again. Listen, I'll be honest, Grace said to me over the phone. John, and I want nothing to do with you. You were on the news last night as someone under investigation by the police. 
Then your mother called to tell me everything. Dad, go to jail. Stay away from us and outside of your schedule. I'm not proud to say that, but unless you're in jail when we marry, don't come. I don't want someone who can so easily destroy this family to be at my side on my best day. I'll get someone else to walk me down the aisle. I didn't say anything as tears flowed down my cheeks. Are you listening, Dad? Do you understand how much you've damaged everything? I didn't say anything, but she could hear me sobbing. Goodbye, Father. You're no longer relevant to me. Don't ever contact me again, and I mean never. Her tone was firm, and she hung up without saying another word. Following these comments, I collapsed on the floor and sobbed. Two days later, the cops arrived at my home, arrested me, and detained me for questioning. The detectives that arrested me did not bother to inquire if I did it. Instead, they simply asked me question after question about where I was hiding the money, who my partners were, and how long I had been cheating my former employer. They eventually let me go home, but warned me not to leave the city since I had a court appearance the next week. I entered my residence and looked around. The paintings and images of Kelly Grace and me on the walls. We purchased the medals Grace had brought home throughout the years for her school athletic accomplishments. Many memories and wonderful occasions looked empty and pointless. The past week has passed in a haze. Deep down, I realized there was something lacking in this entire situation. I was aware that I was not connecting the obvious dots. Aside from the fact that I was innocent, I had absolutely no knowledge. My wife had left me. My daughter disowned me. I was sacked from my position. My assistant blamed me. Even a close friend treated me poorly and never tried to contact me. The few calls I returned came from erstwhile pals who were disappointed in me. The process repeated itself several times and they requested me not to contact them again. I headed inside the bedroom, defeated and unsure of what my next steps were. As an engineer, I solved problems, but I had no idea what I was solving right now. After showering, I walked downstairs and ate a sandwich made of stale bread and jam. The cardboard-tasting food exacerbated an already bleak situation. I believe I could have gotten through everything if Grace hadn't thrown me out of her life. I looked at the table in front of me. Kelly had used a packet of sleeping pills, and for the first time in my life, I saw an unopened bottle of American honey whiskey. A horrible thought sprang to mind of what would happen if I drank and took pills. I shook my head. This was not a response. I just needed some time. I was served again the next morning. This time, it was a restraining order requiring me to stay at least 100 meters away from Kelly, Grace, John, or Roger, and to leave the residence by the following Monday. Despite rising feelings of helplessness, what piqued my interest was that the restraining order was about Roger. That was bizarre. What's the deal, Roger? Something clicked in my head. Damn it! I let out a shout, not addressing anyone in particular. I texted him without thinking about it. I was filled with wrath and what seemed to be an open wound in my spirit. You are a jerk. It's all your fault. I'm going to beat the heck out of you. But I introduced myself as a buddy. I am going to locate you and destroy you. However, I received no response. A half hour later, the same two detectives arrested me again and chastised me for breaking the restraining order by contacting Roger. They weren't interested in my explanation because they didn't want to hear my narrative. They just wanted to put me in jail because they saw me as the bad person. They knew I was due to leave the house on Sunday and informed me that I would be charged on Monday. They informed me that a detective's car would be placed across the street to watch over me for the next 24 hours, and I was strongly advised not to leave the house and simply pack my belongings. Returning home from a more than upset goodbye to two dumb cops, I was tempted to open a bottle of whiskey, three glasses in ten minutes, and drown my sorrows. I took out three pieces of paper and decided to write notes for Kelly, Grace, and Myra. I wrote to Kelly about my unhappiness with her. I wrote that she was a traitor and that I wished that when she died, she would burn in the bowels of hell for what she had done to me. I cursed it with every nasty thing I could think of, then spat on the paper before folding it and placing it in an envelope. I wrote to Grace about my anguish and dismay that she didn't even question whether I had done what I was accused of. I told her that I had never done anything that she accused me of. I never cheated on her mother, nor did she cheat on me. I informed her that I had never stolen any money and that she would never believe that I would do something like that, demonstrating that she needed to grow up and understand who was giving her this trash. 
Then I softened my tone, encouraging her to love John with all her heart and think kindly of me when things settled down. Finally, I urged her to ensure that Roger did not lead her down the aisle instead of me. My tears marred the paper when I returned the letter to the envelope after he betrayed me this time. I apologized to Myra first. I informed her that this was not her fault. I then brought out what I believed I understood about Roger's betrayal of both of us, and he was the man I assumed was currently sleeping with my wife. I apologized for any embarrassment my furtive glances had caused her. I meant nothing more than embarrassed gratitude for working with such a lovely woman. But I had the utmost regard for her and apologized if my opinions of her corrupted them. Finally, I said that I felt helpless and prayed for her forgiveness. Her wrath had subsided after one day. I sealed each letter in a separate envelope and addressed them by name. Then I took a bottle of whiskey and a bottle of sleeping tablets and headed to the bedroom. I sighed as I put each letter on the bedside table. After some thought, I put a note under the letters, requesting that the investigator investigate Roger's finances if they wanted to know the truth. I ended up writing that the next time, they should do their job rather than forcing an innocent individual to do what I was about to do. I strolled into the bathroom and took my time enjoying a lovely hot shower. I took a couple of sips of whiskey, then another, to wash down all the sleeping tablets. I dried myself, looking in the mirror and wondering what I was doing. I was never like this, but I had a plan of action to get out of this situation. If the world no longer wants me, I will leave. I later learned that Detective David's round lights saved my life. He was tasked with watching my residence from an unmarked automobile across the street that evening. When Mrs. Hawkins, one of our neighbors and possibly one of the few who had no idea what was going on, arrived to inquire about us because of the volume of people coming and going that week. Detective Roundlight welcomed her at the front door. When the two of them knocked on the door and received no response, the detective pushed it open to discover that it was unlocked. He wandered throughout the house until he discovered me on the bedroom floor. An ambulance was dispatched shortly thereafter, and the residence was transformed into a crime scene. Looking back, this was the first break I'd had all week. They discovered me barely alive. Criminologists were brought into the case with the assistance of a detective round lamp. They packed liquor, medicines, and letters. After examining the residence, they discovered three hidden cameras that were recording to a hard drive stashed in a linen closet. I had no idea about them. I had been unconscious for three days, and when I awoke, I was startled to discover myself alive. Where am I? I asked the attractive nurse in a hoarse voice. You're at Hollywood Private Hospital? She replied quietly. Then she put her finger to her lips. She replied quietly, Your friend didn't sleep all night and just fell asleep. Friend? I asked, raising an eyebrow weakly. I have no friends. They all abandoned me. Well, this one didn't, she replied, turning my head to see a very untidy mirror napping awkwardly in one of those enormous faux leather chairs you typically find in a hospital mirror. I murmured gently for some reason, feeling relieved to see her. She woke up from her sleep when I spoke her name, despite everything. The moment she noticed that my eyes were open, she was already next to me. Her hand went inside mine and curled around it. Bart, what the hell are you doing? She barked, but her hand held mine very tenderly, and there were tears in her eyes that threatened to fall, although her bloodshot eyes told me that she had been crying a lot lately. I turned away from her. I thought it would be better this way. I started, shame emanating from me in waves. She snorted. You think that having done it was the only way to escape Bartholomew, another? I've known you for over ten years. I've never seen you give up so easily. What did you think? She repeated her question. We were silent for several minutes. The only sound was the beeping of the cars as she waited for my answer. Mira, I'm sorry. Everyone. I mean everyone. When? Kelly? Then you, then Grace. I couldn't stand it. I've never done any of this. But no one even asked me about it. I felt like I was backed into a corner. My wife told me to go die. My daughter told me I was dead to her. My friend betrayed me. I hurt you and disappointed you. I do not think so. I got drunk, and in a moment of weakness, I did something that made sense to me at that moment. I shouldn't be here, I said, sadly. She nodded and carefully sat down on the edge of the bed. I'm sorry, too, but she said quietly, her own tears threatening to appear. I was angry and upset. 
I didn't stop for a minute to think that you were innocent. I was wrong. It's okay, Mira. She touched me. I know it's wrong, Bart, that you're here, and that you feel like I'm one of those people that made you do this. I'm not sure if I can forgive myself. This time, she cried. It's fine, Mira. It's okay. I closed my eyes for a few minutes, tiredly. We did not say anything. Mira, on the other hand, refused to let me go from her grasp. A doctor interrupted us before we could say anything. He grinned and looked at my map as I opened my eyes. Well, Mr. Other, it's lovely to see you awake. How do you feel? I shrugged. I am alive. I did not expect this. He frowned. Mira did the same. So, let's see if we can keep you like this, he said, downplaying my sad comment for the next two minutes. He inspected me. Mira stepped aside and observed a detective who wanted to meet you when you awoke. He's been here several times. Miss Brown was speaking to him. He finished nodding at Mira. When he had finished, I looked down at the bed. He reiterated his caution to continue to rest and not move. He left Mira and I alone. I could not look at her. So I'm presuming you came here because of my letter? I asked. She shakes her head. I haven't received the letter yet despite the fact that Detective Brown Light told me about him. More tears threatened to fall. My relative works in administration and saw your name on the intensive care unit roster. He called and informed me that they had brought you. Mira said, almost. I could still not look at her without feeling ashamed. Mira shuddered but kept continuing. I was already feeling depressed, Bot. I was still upset as I left, but deep down I knew you had nothing to do with this deception. I mean, I have been your assistant for years, if anyone knew you could attempt to steal money, it would be me. But I had to pause for a bit, regardless of how angry I was. If I had done this, I would have known you were set up. When my cousin Maurice called to tell me, he informed me you were here, I knew. I just knew you hadn't done those dreadful things. I'm so sorry, Bart, I am really and truly sorry. Mira cried, her head dropping to my chest. I could feel her tears pouring through the hospital gown, I heard her whisper that she was continuously sad that she had almost lost her best friend. After a few minutes, she stood up and cleaned her face. This time, as she tried to remove her hand from mine to wipe her eyes, I grabbed her and refused to let go. Then she took the second handkerchief in her free hand, carefully wiped the tears from my eyes, and smiled shyly. Mira took a long breath as I continued to think about it. I didn't understand how you could accomplish that. You've always enjoyed your job, but when Roger gave me the signed documents, I was furious with you. She sensed my tension at Roger's name and tried to look aside. It was him, right? Roger set you up, did he? She inquired quietly. I nodded. I guess so. I don't have proof, but it appears to be true. He didn't notify us about the expense overruns, and he just signed documents that I'd never seen completed. I also believe he is having an affair with Kelly. I paused. My eyes were closed. Myra's hand still rested in mine. Myra, I'm sorry, too. I never imagined Roger or Kelly would damage you. But I can't help it. All of the evidence is against me. I cannot prove my innocence. This is why I did what I did. I let the words fade. There was silence for a minute until a fresh, unexpected voice entered the conversation. Okay, I know you couldn't. They did an excellent job of setting you up forging your signature and making you appear like a crime leader. However, crooks who get away with hundreds of thousands of dollars do not act like you. The man who entered the room was huge and very fit. He looked like he had played rugby and carried himself with confidence. So I assumed I used to have Mr. Different. I am Detective David Round Light. I, together with your neighbor, Mrs. Hawkins, found you. I'm delighted to see you're feeling better. I shrugged. Sorry, detective, but I'm sure you'll arrest me in a few days when I'm released. I responded with some animosity. I felt Myra's hand grasp mine. About that, stated the detective in a round light. Myra and I gazed at him. He raised his hand, running it through his hair. I have now been tasked with your case. I understand everything. Several points do not add up. Do you want to be interrogated again? I guess so. I mean, do I have anything else to lose? I gave a categorical answer to the police detective. How about he hires a lawyer? Myra quickly inquired. Shouldn't he have a lawyer? The detective exhaled. Yes, he can hire an attorney. We should not say anything while he is gone. Yes, he should probably employ a lawyer. Myra nodded. She turned to face me. 
Bart, I will take care of it. She apologized and let go of my hand for the second time since I awoke. As she exited the room, calling a number on her phone, the detective and I observed her. She may have been upset with me for what I'd done, but she was still a walking fantasy, and both of us pure-blooded guys knew it. She likes you, the detective added. Round light, I laughed. She has been working for me for ten years. We've both had a difficult week, so she's feeling a little protective of me right now. I believe it is slightly more than that. Unofficially, I read your letters and speak with her. She will be a little devil for your wife if she ever finds herself in the same room as her. He gazed at the door through which she left. She cares deeply about you, Mr. Older. And right now, detective, I believe you could use a few folks on your side, I inquired, giving him a skeptical look. He stared at me. I'm not sure if you should tell me this. After all, I am the one being examined. He grinned. That is correct, Mr. O. There, but I believe there is more to your case than the other two idiots you encountered. Thought. Furthermore, I overheard your words on the way here. You believe you are innocent, right? He asked. Except for the fact that I had a run-in with dumbasses and caused it myself. Of course I am innocent. I'd never steal money from a place where I enjoyed working. So what? He inquired when Myra returned to the room. My second cousin, Reagan Brown, would represent Bart, she stated as if nothing had happened. Detective Roundlight grinned and handed Myra his business card. I know Miss Brown. She's a good lawyer. She will take care of you, Mr. Different. He stared at Myra. Have your second cousin contact me as soon as Mr. Different and she speak. The sooner the better. The three of us talked for a few more minutes before he left. This was odd. I made a comment when he departed. Yeah, typically the police should not be as nice or on your side. Myra agreed. We spent a few more awkward minutes before I introduced a new topic. Who is looking after Tilly while you are here? Currently, she is with my mother. She went to her purse and took out a painting. Did Tilly draw this for you? She smiled and handed it to me. Tilly had drawn on a folded piece of paper. It was a photograph of a hospital with an ambulance inside. She created a pencil drawing of me in bed and wrote the words, Get well soon, in an eleven-year-old girl's handwriting. I had to wipe away a few tears. Thank you, I spoke hoarsely. Have you heard from Grace? Myra shakes her head. No, I tried calling her a few times. I left a few messages, but nothing, she said regretfully. We talked quietly for approximately 45 minutes until Reagan, Myra's second cousin, emerged. After the show, Myra excused herself and left me with Reagan, like Myra. Reagan was a gorgeous woman. She had sandy brown hair, not platinum like Myra's, but standing next to each other revealed that they were connected. She likes you. It has always been like way, Reagan said at one point during our conversation. I snorted, just like when Detective Round told me about it before. I responded, she knows me and has worked for me for many years. This time, Reagan snorted. Men, what do you understand? I laughed. I believe I have a potential ex-wife who has demonstrated that I have no clue. I responded, laughing without humor. She smiled sadly. Don't worry about it. I received an initial report and spoke with a detective round late on my way here. Surprisingly, he is on your side. I also have some theories regarding what is going on with you. So now that we've spoken, leave it to me. The only crime you committed here was loving and trusting someone you probably shouldn't have. Reagan gave me a sorrowful expression as she gazed at my bandages. Sorry, Bart. Myra has told me quite a bit about you over the years. She has a great deal of regard for you. And from what I've learned this week, she is far more distraught by how she treated you than by the fact that she lost her job. She cares deeply about you. I began to frame a question, but she raised her hand. Don't worry, Bart Reagan assured me. I will represent you both at your former workplace for unjust dismissal. If I am correct, a large number of dominoes will fall rapidly. But for you right now, in addition to healing, I need the divorce petition that your ex-wife sent you. So, since I represent you, what do you want? My face clouded. I want as much as possible. I stated it quietly. Reagan saw the concealed hatred in my voice. Kelly and Roger mocked me, most likely by blaming me. They got away with stealing the majority of the firm's money. You have the ability to unleash complete and total destruction on them. She chuckled and then winked. Take no prisoners and don't be concerned about the body count. Understood. 
I liked my new lawyer. Reagan spent some additional time with me. She asked a few more questions regarding preparation for my self-harm event, as she referred to it, and then said goodbye, assuring me that everything was great. Reagan informed me that she will most likely contact me within a few days. If nothing else happened to perform a formal police interrogation after my discharge, the following few days were rather frustrating. After my last week, I was essentially lying in a hospital bed, with doctors and nurses checking me every few hours. I didn't own a phone. He was still at home, so I couldn't phone anyone, and I didn't believe anyone would want to speak with me. But when Myra arrived the next day, she handed me an old paperback book called Endymion by Dan Simmons. I chuckled as she handed it to me. When Myra handed it to me and sat down on the chair next to my bed, she pulled out her novel, Pride and Prejudice, which I had read many years before and much enjoyed. I inquired about what she was doing there. A foolish man. I am here to look after you. What's her response? She shook her head and grinned. We chatted and discussed what happened to us during the day, with the doctor's permission. She came out at lunchtime and served me a roast beef roll with gravy and fried potatoes, while she had a chicken roll. Despite the pain, I started feeling like myself again. On the second day, Myra was gone all morning but returned in the middle of the afternoon, just as the doctors removed the IV from my arm and informed me that if my blood tests came back clean, I would be discharged the next morning. I looked at Myra. I'm not sure where to go. I don't even have a phone or money to hire a hotel room. I understand. I can't go home. Myra smiled. Speaking of the house, Reagan secured a court order to take some of your personal possessions. I was able to take your phone, wallet, clothing, laptop, iPad, and shaving supplies. Myra, I exclaimed, surprised that she would do this for me. Thank you. Now I can try to get a motel anywhere. I gazed at her. I only have one friend in the world. What? I inquired, noting the anxious expression on her face. She paused. You were correct about Roger and Kelly. She halted again when Reagan, I, and the officer arrived to take up your belongings. They were both rather nude. They appear to have lived together and were unprepared for company. I sincerely apologize, Bart, she replied quietly. I exhaled. It's okay, Myra. No, it is not true, but thank you for being open with me. What occurred when they spotted you? She grinned again in response to the query. They began screaming, telling me I needed to get out until the police told them to step away or they would be jailed for violating a court order. The police then allowed me into your room to get your belongings. Myra started to cry. Erase the stain. She took a deep breath. It is still there. If I hadn't been with you since you were brought here, I would have panicked. Will you never do something like this again? I raised my hands. I promise. I responded. The next day, after showering and shaving, I left the hospital. Myra and I met and went out together. She took my hand and led me to her car. As we walked, we drove for a few minutes until we arrived at some condominiums near King's Park. Myra, what are we doing here? I cannot stay with you, I said, recognizing where we were headed. Of course you can, silly. You do not have to spend money on a hotel. You can stay in the guest room for a few days. Reagan will also be meeting us here this afternoon. She has everything on her mind about your situation, so don't miss it. Myra said this with a smile. I've made several trips to Myra over the years. It was a little two-story home with three bedrooms, two bathrooms, a modest kitchen, and a modest living room. Her mother only paid visits to Myra and Tilly on occasion, and they were extremely self-sufficient. They blend in nicely in this environment. After working with Myra for so long, I knew she only owed a little mortgage on her home. Despite her appearance, Myra was not a party girl, and I knew she adored Tilly. And that's where the majority of her money went. We... We brought my baggage into her home. She then showed me the spare bedroom closet and everything before Reagan arrived. Reagan arrived approximately an hour later. She walked in and sat down, taking several folders out of her purse with a businesslike air on her face. You, Bartholomew, are a really happy person. She said, Seriously, I swallowed your wife and your best friend almost got away with cheating on you and taking everything. Right now, I have to inform you that your bank accounts are stopped. This includes both your savings accounts and the account that received the missing funds. This account was created in your name fraudulently. Myra and I glanced at each other. Reagan went on to say, It looks that your so-called friend Roger has learned how to fake your signature in recent months. 
And then a few months ago, he and your wife went to a local bank and opened an account in your name. I was able to get a video capture that proved it was them. In addition, I filed a petition to suspend their passports and sued them for fraud and mental cruelty. They are in serious peril. My lawyer told Myra and me while smiling. She went on to say that I had launched legal procedures against your old firm for unjust dismissal of both of you. And I believe everything should be ready by the end of the week. I spoke with the detective around light, so we'll go tomorrow morning and he'll do a proper interrogation. She stared at me. It will be a routine action. Simply follow my example and everything will be okay. I expect your wife and buddy to be arrested very soon. Over the following hour, the three of us discussed specifics and signed several contracts. Reagan knew that the allegations against me would be dropped the next day. After she went, I spent a few minutes unpacking. Some fabric is in my room, and I took my toiletries to the bathroom mirror, and we spent the entire day talking about what we imagined would happen next. Then, as Myra departed to pick up Tilly from school, I turned on my phone for the first time in days. I was greeted with a combination of missed calls and text messages, the majority of which were from Kelly, telling me how pathetic I was and that all I needed to do was sign the divorce papers or I'd wind up in jail. What was intriguing was that during the last two days, I got multiple missed calls from my former employer requesting that I call them back as soon as possible. But there was no news from Grace, which disappointed me. After Myra and Tilly arrived home, my worries were forgotten. An 11-year-old girl wanted to tell me about her day at school, what they did, who she played with, how she told them about me in the hospital and how I would stay with her till things improved. She was full of enthusiasm and I must say that I enjoyed it. While Myra made dinner, I sat down beside Tilly. We finished her schoolwork and read her school book for reading practice. She was a fantastic reader and I enjoyed reading with her. Tilly was a little version of Myra, I knew she'd become a heartbreaker as she grew older. She was so lively and innocent, and I prayed she would maintain it that way for as long as possible. After dinner and a shower, the three of us sat down to watch some TV before bed. Tilly was pleased to show me the most recent episodes of Bluey, a children's television series. It worked for me as an adult. Tilly, as amused as she was, requested that I tuck the blanket under her and embrace her. So I almost cried. She told me she was really thrilled, and I felt better once she let me go. Okay, I had to dry my eyes after that since I traded places with Myra, who also wished Tilly good night. It felt like it had been a lifetime since I had experienced such unconditional affection from someone. My daughter threw me under the bus, which still hurts me. Tilly's naive concern for my feelings relieved me from losing touch with elegance. After that... Myra and I sat down on the sofa to discuss. She would often hold my hand and embrace me tightly before we went to bed, assuring me that everything would be well. The next day, we had an interrogation and a detective round light, and Reagan confirmed that all allegations against me were withdrawn immediately following the interrogation. That evening, the news reported that Kelly and Roger had warrants out for their arrest on a variety of offenses, including fraud and identity theft. They are currently missing. Later that evening, Grace attempted to call me for the first time, but I directed her to voicemail. I wasn't prepared to talk to her. The following day was a little bittersweet. Grace called me several times and left a few messages requesting me to call her, but I still didn't want to talk to her. She needed to be cleared before she could care for me. I was infuriated. She pushed me aside without a second thought, then ignored Myra's calls while I was hospitalized. Now that it was disclosed that she wanted to talk about her mother and Roger's remorse, my daughter could eat crow for the time being. However, that night, as we were all sleeping, I had a nightmare. I woke up sweating profusely and screamed at the top of my lungs before I knew what was occurring. Myra was there, wide-eyed and concerned. Even Tilly stood in the doorway, tears running down her cheeks. I buried my face in my hands and wailed. I apologize. I am terribly sorry. I cannot. Finally, I began to relax, and they both climbed onto my bed mirror, climbed over me, and remained on one side, while Tilly lay comfortably on the other. Myra wrapped her arms around my neck, pulling me close. "'It's fine, Uncle Bart,' remarked Tilly. "'You had a nasty dream. Sometimes it happens. Mom and I will stay with you. Go to sleep.' I attempted to fall back asleep, but I couldn't. 
After a while, I noticed Tilly had fallen asleep with her small hand on my stomach, but Myra seemed to be staring at me. Are you all right, Bart? She asked with genuine worry in her voice, hugging me like a mother would, her newly hatched chicks. For a time, I considered, no, sorry, Myra, I do not think so. It was a dream from that night. I mean, when I... I could not say it. Myra bent down and kissed my cheek, so I believe she understood what I was saying. And then I felt her nose nuzzle against my neck. What will we do, Bart? She exclaimed quietly. This is unjust. You do not deserve this. She cried. Her voice was filled with hurt and contempt towards me. I explained, hugging her, and held her close. I tried not to wake Tilly, who was dozing lightly and clinging to me. We will work it out. Everything will be okay. At that point, I felt as if I had found myself again. If this makes sense, Myra's anguish and concern for me brought me back to reality for the first time since that night. I hugged Myra and Tilly close to me till the light came up. A new day dawned. The following morning, both ladies hugged me tightly. After breakfast, Myra took Tilly to school. I utilized this opportunity to begin looking for a consultant. I needed aid. By the time Myra returned, I had already made a number of calls informing her that I was seeking psychological assistance. Myra offered me her brightest smile, followed by a more serious smile. Bart, may we chat about something for a minute? She inquired, taking me to the sofa where we both sat. I glanced at her for a while and nodded, assuming I knew what she wanted to talk about. It's fine, Myra, I said. I understand that last night was scary. It is not really healthy to have Tilly here. If I wake up screaming again, I'll find another location. Her eyes widened, and she rapidly pressed her palms against mine, a scared expression on her face. No, Bart, that's not what I wanted to talk about, she answered, taking a long breath. Actually, Bart, it is just the reverse. I'm not sure how to explain it, but I just need. I looked at Myra. Her expression was gorgeous but puzzling. Bart, I am in love with you, Myra quickly blurted out. Consider how you will react to unexpected facts. Sorry, I said that like a foolish idiot. I said I was in love with you. I have been in love for a long time. She repeated it more modestly, flushing slightly. I leaned back against the sofa and she smiled sheepishly, scanning my face for my thoughts. Sorry, Bart, but I can't hold back any longer, Myra told me, as I reflected on her remarks after learning that you were in hospital. I was afraid. I couldn't get there quickly enough. I felt terrible for taking it out on you, and I promised myself not to tell you how I truly felt, but you nearly died. Your wife and best friend have just betrayed you. When you got out, you came here. So I didn't feel like I needed to say anything because you were here with Tilly and myself. I assumed you'd realize this sooner or later, but Myra, why? Why are you telling me what caused it? I asked. Her laughter was quiet, yet it was tinged with regret. You, you silly idiot. Something happened last night that harmed you. It hurt my heart to see you this way, but I need to be there for you so you can fall asleep in my arms. I'd like to think I can alleviate your load. I rooted for you. I simply can't. Bart, I don't want to hold back any longer. Myra's gaze soon shifted to mine. As to why it was always you, have you ever noticed that I do not go on dates? She said, leaning her head to one side. Yes, I responded, tilting my head slightly to the side in question but I've always imagined it was because of Tilly. That's part of it, I added. Myra cautiously agreed. But Bart, I've never found somebody that can compare to you. I turned my head curiously to the opposite side. Myra smiled. Look, she replied, from the moment I began working with you, you have never treated me differently from anyone else. Instead, you spent time explaining everything. You were nice to everyone and helped them learn from their mistakes. Whenever you saw Tilly, you were friendly and made her feel special. For example, you may help her with her homework or read with her. She has never met her father. However, she regards you as a father figure. Look how she crawled in on you last night because she knew you were in pain. But Myra, I stared at her. She raised her hand to interrupt him when we were bombarded with information last week. You attempted to take it upon yourself. You did not scream or yell. You did not treat me unfairly when I threw a tantrum and smacked you. Myra flushed. You are a fantastic person, Bartholomew. I love you for this and many other reasons. And if Kelly is stupid enough to abandon you, I'll take you back. You'll forget the bitch's name after a month of receiving so much affection. She came over and kissed me. After a few moments, I kissed her and hugged her. 
time appeared to stand still. Will you take me, Bart? Will you make me your woman? Myra inquired, her stare transformed into that of a seductress. I was just proposed to by one of the most attractive women I've ever met. If I were honest with myself, I would admit that I have had fantasies about her in the past. I now have this opportunity. But events moved swiftly. I knew nothing would ever happen between Kelly, myself, and Myra. The fact that she loved me made me feel less like a loser, but I was concerned it would also be a comfort. I believe Myra recognized my inner anguish, but she said nothing. She stood up, took my hand, and led me into her bedroom. We made love. Following that, we fell asleep while sleeping. I experienced a similar dream to the prior one. We awoke to the sound of the alarm clock. Wrapped in Myra's arms, I was shivering and sweating, but not shouting as we dressed. I explained my dream to her. Myra had a worried expression on her face, and she took me with her to pick up Tilly from school. This took another few weeks. Roger and Kelly had already been arrested and held in custody. They learned that the police wanted to question them after the charges against me were dropped. They drove from Perth to Adelaide in a panic, but were stopped by Australian customs as they attempted to leave the country. It took two months before Western Australian police relocated them to Perth. However, I must admit that my relationship with Myra improved dramatically during that time. After the first night, I moved into her bedroom. Now we're in our bedroom, and I must admit that I feel like I'm 20 again. I think it's pretty obvious that I fell in love with this woman when the police brought Roger and Kelly back to Perth. I noted that Myra was correct. I could barely remember Kelly, and I didn't want to save these memories. Like me, Myra has only ever been with one person, her loser boyfriend. A month after Roger and Kelly were brought to Perth, Myra Regan and I found ourselves in a courtroom as witnesses against them. Roger never looked at me directly, even when I was in the witness box. As a result, he was sentenced to 15 years. Kelly, on the other hand, couldn't stop staring at me the entire time. During the trial, it was revealed that Roger was the mastermind behind it all. It was he who seduced Kelly and her into cheating, so everyone was surprised when Kelly received 20 years. She was found to be an accomplice in the fraud, but when charges of mental abuse were also brought against her for her actions against me, she was given an additional five years with evidence found on the hidden cameras Kelly installed on Roger. The judge also granted our divorce immediately after the verdict. Reagan protested the division of our savings specified in the divorce papers that Kelly had prepared. Reagan also stated that I was willing to sell the house and immediately split the proceeds because I had no intention of staying in a house where such terrible things were happening. Finally, Reagan also told the court that I am willing to serve as trustee of Kelly's funds until she finishes serving her sentence. It took a lot of effort on Reagan's part to convince me to agree to this. It showed that I was willing to put up with some obstacles and went a long way towards stopping Kelly's lawyer from fighting over the stupid things they often do in divorces. I was not allowed to use Kelly's funds, but I could invest them along with any funds I had invested. The courts ruled that Roger and Kelly were to be immediately sent to serve their sentences. And in his closing statement after the ruling, Kelly's lawyer asked me to spend an hour with her before she was sent to prison. After several minutes of hesitation, feeling the eyes of the entire court on me, I agreed. Kelly was still in her court attire when she was brought into the interview room just after the court was dismissed. The room was fairly well furnished, although the table was screwed down, and there were chains on the legs of the chairs to prevent them from being thrown. When Kelly sat down, she looked depressed and broken, just as I felt at her betrayal. Her shoulders were slumped, unlike in the courtroom. She didn't look me in the eye. Her prison guard told us she would be right outside the door, just knock, when we were done. There was no real rush for several minutes. Neither of us said anything. It was the first time we had been in the same room since Kelly told me to do something that I ended up trying to do. Sorry, Bart, she said quietly, looking at her hands. I was a little surprised that she spoke first and that her first words were an apology. The words said were clearly on the opposite end of the spectrum. Are you sure, Kelly? I asked, letting a hint of bitterness creep into my tone. She stared at me. Tears appeared, but did not fall. Yes, Bart, I'm very sorry. I wanted to respond and reject her apology, but she did the classic raised hand and pause, so I held my tongue and waited. Please, Bart, let me talk about it before scolding me. Kelly expressed sadness. I leaned back in my chair and motioned for her to proceed. 
Thank you, regretful Lee replied, looking me squarely in the eyes for the first time since she entered the room. I'm extremely sorry, Bart. I had no idea what occurred to me then. I've loved you for so long. Despite the fact that I have done such terrible things, I still love you. Worse, I knew how much you loved me. You were the ideal spouse and partner. But one day, I awoke feeling, I don't know, lost. She averted her gaze from mine, returned to her hands, and resumed speaking. So, around a few weeks after I initially started feeling lost, things began to spiral out of control. I was starting to worry about you since you still loved me despite the fact that I thought I was wrong. Roger recognized something was amiss with me when we were working on this terrible project together. She started wringing her hands. We didn't start dating until approximately a month later. Roger persisted. He knew exactly which buttons to press. I still loved you, but he understood how to exploit my anxieties and coerce me into bed. He then utilized my shame to carry out his plan. I don't think you knew it. However, Roger has always envied your leadership abilities. He was always irritated by the fact that he felt like a second fiddle to you. He devised a scheme to force the client to pay a large sum of money for something that never occurred, making it appear as if you were stealing money from the business. To my humiliation, we both conspired against you and set things in motion. We opened a new bank account in your name and made certain you were insolvent. We both realized bit by step that you loved me and completely trusted me. And Roger understood that once things calmed down with you in prison, his money, our savings, and the money we stole, we could go to another country. And if they ever find out, we'll be out of reach. Kelly spoke, shaking her head, doubting her own words. That's all for now, I said, trying to keep my fury in check. Nobody cared that you were gradually destroying me in the process. She nodded regretfully. Yes. I didn't want to, but Roger did. He disassembled me one piece at a time until I agreed. Although I was concerned about our plan's success, you had to be so damaged that you couldn't doubt anything. You came close to success here. I interrupted her. You could have gotten away with everything if Detective Round, Light, and Mirror hadn't been present. We remained silent for a while before Kelly asked quietly, Can you let me view them? I got what she was saying and carefully placed my hands on the table, palms up. Kelly gasped and began to cry as she looked at my scars. She began to grab for them, but suddenly drew her hands outside. I sat expressionless internally, yet feelings ranging from fury to embarrassment were running through my mind. What bothered me was that there was at least one ounce of affection present, even after everything this woman had put me through, but I hated having to admit it. Kelly looked at me and tensed, indicating that I had failed to mask my emotions. I am sorry, Bart. I'm deeply sorry I'm ashamed that I compelled you to do it. She paused. I'm going to take twenty years without appeal. I deserved this, following what I did to you. I just nodded. I'm glad she'd serve her sentence without question. She took another glance at me. Bart. I looked across at Kelly. Just so you know, you have never been a bad lover. In comparison to Roger, you are great. I don't have a justification for what I did to you last morning. I was mistaken. We were silent for a minute. So you and Mira? She inquired. Questionably? Yes, I said cautiously. She gave a slight smile. Okay, you're aware that she has loved you for a long time. My now ex-wife responded as if nothing had occurred. I responded that I only lately became aware of this. Her next sentence stunned me with both passion and anguish in her voice. Let her adore you, Bart. Allow her to relieve the agony I gave you. Her eyes were filled with large tears, but she didn't stop looking at me. I understand that I have no right to advise you. However, this woman is in love with you, and unlike me, she would never abandon you. She desired you for many years and never attempted to seduce you. I failed the first time I was tested. She embodies everything I am not. My now ex-wife informed me sadly. Kelly. I wasn't sure what to say. Don't worry, she said, wiping her tears away with her sleeve. I'll be okay. I have accepted to your terms. I was shocked that you were willing to look after my money while I was in prison. You're a better person than I ever dreamed. I sighed. Kelly, I once loved you more than I believe you realized. If you had informed me how you felt, maybe we might have avoided everything. I'm doing my best, though. Forget what you've done to me. But just so you know, I'm still angry inside. 
I'd like to holler at you. I want to end my life because of what you told me back then. But I can't, Kelly. I'm the one that has to deal with it. For a few while, neither of us spoke. As we exchanged glances, Bart Kelly spoke up. I apologize for what I did to you. You have the right to expect more from me, and I feel the same guilt for pushing you harder than you do. We're being honest with one another. I'll always feel humiliated. I saw the letter you wrote, and you were correct that I would be burned for what I did. But I thank God that you are still alive. I tightened my teeth for almost a minute. My feelings were still strong. Kelly, how could you say such things now? How could she be sensitive and try to remove the rage and grief I was feeling? It was unfair, so I changed the subject. I offered to manage your money out of respect for our time together. You will have enough money to start afresh if you wish, I said, attempting to conceal my emotions but failing. Kelly saw through my poorly veiled attempt to conceal, but laughed bitterly at the change of topic. Most certainly I will be older than sixty. Hopefully this is enough to retire. Sixty is not a lot. I said keep your cool and you'll be strong in your eighties. We talked for a few more minutes about how she preferred to get information about her funds. This eased both of us slightly, but I sensed she was ready to move on to the next issue. Have you talked to Grace? She inquired somewhat hesitantly. I shook my head. Grace basically directed me where to go, and I was dead to her. She believed the lies. You and your lover gave her the gospel. This was the conversation that broke me. When I looked at Kelly, she winced as she noticed the agony and sadness in my eyes. Kelly. She never asked if I was guilty. She never gave herself cause to question. She threw me out without looking at me. Right after that call, I stopped and stood up, moving away so Kelly wouldn't see me cry. If I had turned to look at her while I was crying, I would have seen Kelly also crying. She realized I couldn't tell. I turned away from Kelly. I continued when I was in the hospital. Myra attempted to reach her but had no response. Then, like Kelly before, I wiped my face with my arm and turned around. Kelly sat back down, trying to wipe the tears from her face. I apologize, Bart. Kelly winced. Much of it was orchestrated by Roger and me. To my eternal humiliation, it was arranged that Grace would turn against you. I just nodded. Kelly noticed the fury in my eyes as she admitted her and dropped her head in shame. I was ready to yell at her for damaging my relationship with my daughter, but she was aware of what she had done. Kelly simply confessed it, if it helps you feel any better. Kelly lamented that Grace had also cut me out of her life. I haven't been chastised this much since I was a kid, but I know I deserve it and more. Bart Kelly spoke quickly, the melancholy in her voice replaced by something more intense. Our little girl requires you. She is afraid and assaults everyone, Kelly stated quietly. Right now, she and John are fighting over something, and you know it's not them today. I am worried about her. It is my fault, but I cannot correct it. I know. She feels bad about how she treated you, but you don't speak to her thereafter. Everything just makes everything worse. Kelly hesitated for a time. Bart, I realize I have no right to ask you for anything. Kelly hesitated, looking at me again and wringing her hands. But would you be able to forgive Grace? Our daughter requires the presence of one or both of her parents. I now realize that even if I hadn't been in prison for so long, my remorse for what I did to you and for turning Grace against you would have consumed me for the next many years. And in the end, she would still despise me. Kelly gave a snort. It'll be better, it will be preferable if you are the one to take her. Suppose you had died. I'm not sure what she would have done. Please, Bart. In that regard, take good care of our daughter. My non-existent ex-wife begged me. Kelly. I took a big breath and contemplated what to say. What you are asking is difficult. You caused a lot of suffering, but you were my wife, not my blood. Grace informed me she never wanted to see me again and that I was dead to her. Not a day had passed since you instructed me to go die. It hurt more than everything you did to me. I want to get back together with her. However, Kelly is in pain. The anguish of what my family did to me and what our daughter did. I don't know how to handle it. Kelly gave a nod. I understand, she added regretfully, knowing how hard I was trying, but I still had a lot to go through. She recognized how difficult it felt to be rejected. She was living it right now. I sighed and glanced at my ex-wife. Look, Kelly, I'm going to do whatever it takes not to despise you. I am obtaining professional assistance. 
Even with that assistance, it takes everything I have within of me not to shout and yell at you, and I will make no guarantees regarding Grace. But I'll consider about speaking with her shortly. Throughout the exchange, she looked broken. Kelly seems to have aged. There was no more to say. She got up. Bart, I realize this is meaningless to you right now, but I'll say it again. I sincerely apologize for anything I did to you. I don't have an excuse, and I am aware that I will never be able to atone for this. I shall finish my time, and while I may never have it, I hope you will forgive me someday. Kelly sniffles yet again. He then looked at me. Age-related creases and wrinkles are now readily noticeable on her face. You may not believe me, but I still and will always adore you. I may have lost sight of it for a bit, but I recall us standing awkwardly. Kelly's eyes welled up with tears as she approached and banged on the door. The prison convoy unlocked it. Kelly paused and returned my gaze. I love you, Myra. Bart, give her the affection that I so foolishly squandered. Live a wonderful life and keep your head up. There are individuals around you who adore you. Never forget that even in your worst moments, someone loves enough to assist you get back on your feet. I overlooked it. But Bart, I'm proud of you. You rediscover your true self. Goodbye. You are my man. I won't forget you. Kelly murmured with regret as she parted ways and exited the room. I reflected on our chat. There were no screaming. Kelly acknowledged responsibility and agreed to her prison sentence. As I rose up and turned to exit the room, I noticed a line of little drips on the tile floor in the direction Kelly had taken. I turned away, weeping for what once was. Then he turned and walked in the opposite direction. I was escorted out of the guarded area into the public gallery and my attitude quickly lifted when I saw Myra standing there waiting for me. Even on this particular occasion, my assistant, who later became my lover, looked stunning. Her beautiful blonde hair cascaded over her shoulders, back, and just above her waist, but her attire still spoke of her seduction. She gave me a kiss. Is everything going well? She inquired. Yes, I was amazed. I was expecting a lot of excuses and accusations to be flung at me, but she accepted the most of the blame and expressed incredible regret towards me. What are your thoughts on this? Myra questioned me. I pondered for a bit. Are you still holding Myra? To be honest, I'm still angry with both Roger and her, but unlike Roger, I am sorry for her. She is aware that she has damaged everything in her life and is now facing the consequences. Grace apparently cut Kelly out of her life because of what she'd done. Myra gave a nod. She paused for a moment over it. She stared at me briefly. John and Grace are present, while you were with Kelly. John approached me and informed me that they would be at the cafe across the street within the next few hours. If you wanted to discuss, he knows you're upset. They've certainly considered how Grace treated you, but she's yearning to see you. I took a deep breath and glanced at my sweetheart. Do you think I should speak to her? I inquired. Myra gave a nod. Yes, love, I can't repair the pain in your soul. Grace is the only one who can. And if it helps, I'll accompany you. I will be by your side for as long as you need. She smiled at me. If you need Mama Bear to appear, I will claw her eyes out. Bart, I love you. She spoke as if she ruled the world for me. I bent over and kissed her. Myra, I also love you. Her eyes grew wider. This was my first public proclamation of love for her. We received a few glances from folks walking by, including lawyers, judges, and criminals. But I didn't care just then. Myra was the only one I saw. Then let us go. I spoke. And we took a walk. Crossing the street and entering the cafe hand in hand. When Myra and I arrived at their table, we immediately recognized my daughter and her fiancé. Grace was split between running into the mountains and sweeping me off my feet with an embrace. I went with the latter option. I spread my arms. Grace slipped towards me, and I felt my shirt get moist as she began to cry. I am sorry, Daddy. She kept repeating it for several minutes. I looked at Myra, who was smiling, and at John, who had no idea where to look. After a few minutes, I moved her away from me, and we sat down. We all ordered beverages and something to eat, and I decided it was time to start. Is it simply to your mother? I said quietly. Grace gave a nod. I heard you, Dad. I apologize. It was just that. I raised my hand. Now it was my time. I know. Gracie. You apologize. Your mother provided detailed explanations. However, you should know what you stated. I'm in a lot of pain. It stung worse than anyone had ever done before. 
At the time, I thought I had nowhere to go. One of the few people I expected to care for me, regardless of the circumstances, dumped me without a second thought. What hurt me the most was that you did not even inquire if I was guilty. Grace reddened profusely. Her mortified expression was evident. She straightened her shoulders. No, I have to say this, she said more to herself than everyone else. I noticed that John did not say anything but reassure her by squeezing her hand. Dad, forgive me. I should have allowed you time to respond. I should have allowed you to explain everything. But I didn't. I can't blame Roger or Mom for my behavior. But they told me how horribly I screwed up. How you went to jail and how you had an affair. She glanced at Myra. Mom, with Roger's help, constantly telling me how dishonest you were, they were unstoppable by the time you called. I was so scared that I said several things that I now regret. John gave a nod. I assumed that was the bulk of their argument. Dad, when Myra left messages about you at the hospital, I believed it was all a ruse. I mean, Mom and Roger were still talking negatively about you, and Myra was the one you were conspiring with. Grace kept glancing between Myra and myself. They believed you only wanted attention since Myra was part of your plan, but, Dad, it is true that you tried. She was unable to finish the sentence. We couldn't. I apologize, Gracie, yes. I was in a difficult predicament and couldn't see any way out after hearing my confession. Grace burst out crying again, covering her face in her hands. Myra melted next to me as her and my emotions threatened to erupt for several moments. Nobody mentioned anything. John noticed us. I don't want to diminish the gravity of the situation, but I would like to give Grace a break and allow her to settle down. John gave us a smile. Can I conclude that something positive came out of everything that happened? He murmured, pointing at Myra and me hugging. Grace raised her head, and after a second, her eyes widened. Dad, you and Myra? She inquired. Questionably? Yes. I nodded, then felt compelled to explain. But contrary to what your mother claimed, there was no affair. I had never cheated on her when I awoke in the hospital. Myra was present and refused to leave me. You are not aware of it. However, for a time, Myra believed Roger and your mother. We reconciled, and I realized how deeply this woman loved me. John gave a smile. Grace glanced at us with wide eyes, then appeared to regain control. Many thanks. She turned to face Myra. Myra giggled as she said, Thank you for taking my father and being with him when I was a complete idiot. This helped to relieve some of the anxiety. Then we talked for a few hours. We discussed our trials both individually and collectively. I once begged Grace to trade places with Myra so my daughter could embrace me. I wish I could claim that one encounter healed all of our wounds, but it took months for us to feel comfortable talking to each other. Grace and I worked hard to gradually reestablish our father-daughter bond. Grace even visited me for counseling several times. My psychiatrist assisted us in bridging some gaps in issues such as trust, which we had been unable to settle since our first meeting at a cafe. One of the more challenging sessions was when I asked Grace not to entirely cut her mother out of her life. Kelly was a crafty, conniving bitch, but she paid the price, and despite all, she was her mother. She consented to meet her on condition that I accompany her the first time. The meeting was difficult. There wasn't much said because there were so many resentments between the three of us, but Grace genuinely tried. Kelly wrote to me the next week, thanking me for convincing her. Six months after everything went wrong, I asked Myra to marry. I proposed during a family meal. Tilly and Grace encouraged me and told me that now was the moment. John shook my hand and asked me to keep an eye on her. I laughed as he grinned, saying the same thing I told him earlier. Grace and John married shortly after, with my consent. Myra paid a visit to Kelly in prison and requested for permission to take on the role of mother of the bride. Kelly appeared to be in tears, but granted permission. Tilly looked lovely as a flower girl and informed everyone that she was my second daughter. I was no longer Uncle Albert. Instead, I became a father. After reconciling with Grace, I escorted her down the aisle and handed her over to her overjoyed husband. During our father-daughter dance, I felt her press against me and utter a prayer of thanksgiving. 
That night, I felt the last of my hesitation to be around Grace fade away. Grace later sent Kelly a series of images and a note thanking her for allowing Myra to act in her place. I understand Kelly has them on her phone. Reagan arranged a hefty labor settlement for Myra and me when the Roger Kelly case was resolved. For a long, Clarence refused to move, claiming he had done nothing wrong. But a week before our court date, he made an offer that Reagan turned down. It was derogatory and insulting. Then, two days before the trial, he made another offer, which Reagan turned down. As a result, Myra earned a substantial six-figure award. While I received a great seven-figure compensation for a multi-million dollar engineering firm, their payout to us was tiny when compared to the damages that a public litigation would have cost. However, rumors had spread, and Clarence's income plummeted until he retired and sold the business for less than 30% of its value. When I arrived, Myra and I created our own engineering and consulting firm with the money we had earned from our business settlements. We contributed administrative and engineering experience. Within six months, we had five people going across the country to assist with large engineering projects. It was surprised that Peter Pembroke was one of our initial clients. He invited Myra and me to supper and later apologized. He recognized we had all been duped and admitted that the project would have failed if I hadn't coordinated the delivery with my engineering expertise. After that, every year, Myra and I were invited to any important event in Pembroke, whether we worked on their projects or not. Peter was a good guy, but he got into a bad circumstance and wanted to set things right. We also sold Myra's small house and purchased a much larger home just off the road with breathtaking views of King's Park. It was an old house with five bedrooms and three baths that we spent more than two years refurbishing. It was a nice experience. We only took breaks for a few family occasions, such as his wedding and Grace's birth, until his younger brother Byron. Life got better. Despite this, I still experienced horrible dreams on occasion. But Myra was a rock for me. Is there any occasion when I needed her? More than a decade later, Byron was no longer a precocious ten-year-old. Tilly, like Aunt Reagan, attended university to pursue a career in law. And it was a slow Saturday afternoon. Grace and John sat with us on our house's porch, which overlooked King's Park. Byron was playing with my seven-year-old grandson, Bruce, and they were attempting to ignore my five-year-old granddaughter, Hope, when Grace mentioned her mother, Dad. This week I received a letter from my mother. She spoke lightly, yet carefully. Kelly was not a taboo subject in the house, but when she was addressed, everyone acted cautiously. Kelly wrote several emails to me throughout the years, and I even paid her a couple visits. I knew she was in therapy and had a tiny community in prison, despite the fact that she still had eight years to serve. She was regarded as a model inmate. What was she writing? I inquired. She also told me that she received word that Roger had been released last month. Grace stated that when everything had calmed down, I was drinking Kraken and Coke. Last month, I worried. Myra's hand came into contact with mine unexpectedly. Did she mention anything else? Myra inquired with Grace. Grace gave a nod. Yes, she stated he came to see her. Mom thinks he didn't look good. According to the letter, Rogers had a turbulent life. I'll pay her a visit next week and find out what occurred. However, she remarked that the chat with him was not peaceful. We talked for a few more minutes until I excused myself and contacted David Round, whom I had known for many years. He befriended me. David now led a team to investigate extremely heinous crimes, and he solved numerous complex cases that drew widespread notice. The media. But how are you, my friend? How is your gorgeous wife doing? He spoke in a nice tone. Answering my phone, I grinned. Myra is wonderful. I took a pause. David, I just found out Roger had been released. David's demeanor changed, and I noticed. I received the report yesterday. I was planning to tell you about it at the bowling alley next week, he added. On Tuesday nights, David and I bowled on the same team. According to what I read in the paper, he was granted permission to relocate to Adelaide. He apparently got a job in a tiny company there. During his probationary interview, the committee inquired about you and whether he planned to make any contacts. He told them they may rot in hell for wrecking his life, but he understood he needed to leave. No one would recruit him in Western Australia based on his track record. I sighed. Peter proceeded. According to the article, he struggled in prison. 
If you are concerned about having problems with him, I don't think you'll have them. Many thanks, David. This is what concerns me. If I hear anything from him, I will notify you. I responded, exhaling the air I hadn't realized I was holding before returning to the table. We talked briefly about bowling and the approaching cookout. Myra gave me a look as I seated. David? she inquired. I just nodded. He confirmed that Roger had quit and relocated to Adelaide. But he absolutely despises me. I have to admit that the feeling is mutual. I informed the relatives assembled that the rest of the day had been a little melancholy, but I was with my family, and they made me feel supported. That night, I awoke sweaty and screaming from the first nightmare I'd experienced in years. Myra awoke instantaneously. I was perspiring like a pig without asking. Myra contacted my therapist, who was really nice and answered the phone at 2 a.m. Remember, this is why we paid him so much. Myra cried as I told her about my dream, and she clung to me with all her strength. Although it offended my wife, simply expressing it helped me feel better. My therapist listened to me describe the dream, pointing out that it was most likely prompted by the news of Roger's release and the fear I felt about all that had happened since then. This happened more than 13 years ago. We decided to meet again, and I expressed my gratitude for seeing me so early in the morning. When we got back in, Myra checked on Byron, who was still sleeping till he woke up, but returned to bed when she heard us talking on the phone. She requested her mother to tell me that she loved me. After using the restroom, I lay down and Myra curled up on my chest. Do you believe there will be problems with Roger? Myra is slightly concerned. I don't know. I stated that I believe he is going to depart and that we will never hear from him. Even if we did, you know, we are protected. I referred to my hunting gear, which was safely stored in our closet. Myra gave a nod in the darkness. I'm sorry, my darling, that hearing about this disturbed you. Are you all right? Yes, sort of, I replied. Unfortunately, I believe there will always be a shadow present. I don't think about those days very much anymore, but they will always be a part of me. I squeezed the sexy, naked woman who was deeply in love with me. But when I think back on those times, I tend to focus on the lovely blonde who flew in and saved my life. Myra lifted her head and looked at me. I'm serious, my love. I told her I felt so helpless at the time that I thought I had no choice but to end everything. I could have done it again if you had not been there when I awoke. I realized that this would not improve things. Ignoring what happened won't help you. The best thing I can do is make sure as many of my loved ones as possible are there for me, reminding me of everything I have to be grateful for and talking to you when I need to so I don't end up back there. Myra gave a nod. She said, I love you, Bart. I responded, I love you too, Myra. We slept. However, we did not always live happily ever after. There were both good and bad days. Yes, there were quarrels and disagreements. There were many nightmares but I learned more than anything else from this experience. I had the unconditional love of a woman who made everything possible. I had friends who accepted me for who I was and a family who supported me through difficult times. Thank you for listening to today's story. If you enjoyed this article, please like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. If you have a story to tell regarding your or another person's situation, please do not hesitate to contact me. Please take care.